I'm actually going to read the same passage. This will be a little bit of a part two of a sermon I did a couple weeks ago called Eternity on My Mind. And just really talking through this concept that we need to begin with the end in mind. We need to have eternity. Thank you, my man. Uh, we need to have eternity uh, on our radar that ultimately as believers we are called to bear fruit. But we're not just called to bear fruit. We're called to bear fruit that remains, fruit that lasts. And that you cannot define success as a Christian apart from eternity. Eternity is how we filter what is actually successful and not successful in the kingdom of God. So we, we processed through this, talked about this, and ultimately said this, that success in the kingdom is connected to these two things, faithfulness and obedience. The world says success is how much stuff you get, how much power you get, how, much, how, how, how big your house is, whether you got a boat, whether you have raises, whether you have promotions. The world, whether you got fame, whether you got likes, that's how the world defines success. But the kingdom defines success differently. It defines success purely as faithfulness and obedience. And ultimately, ultimately you're going to stand before the Lord one day and, and you have to be able to know this. What matters is what's going to go with you into eternity and what Jesus is actually going to ask you about. Quite frankly, if you're worried about things, or if you're focused on things that aren't going with you into eternity or Jesus is even going to ask you about them, then they are not the mark and they are not success. And this is what Paul writes. So we talked about this and we read this. Because Paul, when he writes to the church in Corinth and then he writes to his spiritual son Timothy, he says this, 1 Corinthians 9, 26. Therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Listen, you have to understand, his comparison is not between somebody who isn't running and somebody who is running. He's not saying, he's not saying, I'm not like someone who isn't running. I'm not like someone who isn't boxing. He says, no, no, I'm not like someone running aimlessly. And I'm not like someone boxing but not hitting the mark. And he makes that distinction. And this is important because one of the sober things we've got to live with in life is you can get to the end of your life and turn around and look and realize this. There was a lot of activity in my life. There was a lot of running in my life. There was a lot of boxing in my life. But I was running aimlessly and I never hit the mark. That's the scary part. The scary part isn't that I never ran anywhere. The scary part is that I ran a lot but didn't actually get anywhere. I had a lot of, I had a lot of spiritual activity but never actually made a difference or made an impact, never hit the mark because of this one reason. I don't even know what the mark is. If you haven't taken the time to determine what is success in the kingdom and what the mark actually is, then how do you know if you're hitting it? How do you know where to go? If you don't know where the finish line is, how do you know if you're running the right direction? And so, so Paul writes this. He says, I didn't run, I, did, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. And he tells the spiritual son this. I have fought the good fight. And then here's how he describes it. So, so he fought the good fight. He finished the race. I have kept the faith. I want to talk to you today about keeping eternity in our mind and the understanding that we're to live bearing eternal fruit. See, God has a plan for your life. A lot of people don't want to know what the plan of God is for their life. You know, should I do this or should I do this? And here, at the end of the day, God has a plan for your life, and it's that you'll bear fruit. You're meant, John 15 says, you're to bear fruit, you're to bear a lot of fruit, and you're to bear fruit that remains, fruit that lasts. That's the goal. The goal is not just to bear fr short-term fruit, it's to bear fruit that remains. That's why you cannot actually determine what success in the kingdom, apart from longevity. Longevity matters. I, I was even, uh, we talk a lot with uh, preachers and pastors, and, and there's always pressure around, you know, they want to know, like, how their sermon was or things like that. And I, I tell them all the time, you, you, when people come up and they might say, like after the day, they might say, hey, how'd your sermon go? And you try to put some parameters around it, like, you know, I felt like people were engaged and felt like, you know, the points went well, and I unpack scripture effectively, or, or, or people raise their hand. You're trying to come up with some measurements. But do you know the honest answer is, how'd your sermon go? I don't know. I'll let you know in 20 years. I don't know how it goes. Because in order to determine how today goes, if it's bearing fruit in 20 years, what a great Sunday. 
If it's not bearing fruit in 20 years, what a crappy Sunday. Like, it, it wasn't a good Sunday. But, we're, but we actually are constantly trying to determine things. But you can't actually determine kingdom success apart from longevity. And not just longevity in the earth, but we're talking eternal longevity. And so, so, so how do we, so the enemy comes, you're, you're, the plan of God for your life is to bear fruit and fruit that remains. And I don't know if you know this, but there is a real enemy. And the devil does not want you bearing fruit. A fruit-bearing Christian who's making an impact in the earth is what, not what he wants. He doesn't want you bearing fruit, and he doesn't want you experiencing the fullness of God. So he's at war with that. And one of the main ways that he's at war with that is he tries to distract you. See, a fruit-bearing Christian is going to be somebody who is focused on eternity. Focused on eternity. And the enemy comes to distract you from eternal things to get you focused on temporal things. Because I will not bear long-term fruit if I have a temporary mindset. I will only bear long-term fr long fruit if I have an eternal mindset. So the enemy comes. If you're a Sacramento Kings fan, you'll get this, which is... People outside Sacramento, Sacramento don't understand this. People, people outside Sacramento don't get what we have gone through as Sacramento Kings fans. They just can't, they can't even wrap their head around what, that we're a one-team town. We have nobody else to root for and the pain of watching every year. And so, but, but when you go, this is the year, guys. This is the year, you know. So, anyways, uh, uh, <laughs> so... So if you ever go to a game, one of the things you'll notice is, is the, the, home, the home field advantage, the home court advantage, they're trying to engage their crowd in kind of participating in some way in the game. And so one of the ways they do that is, is whenever the opposing team is shooting on this basket, they drop these thunder sticks from the, from the ceiling and they're just inflatable blow up. Uh, kind of rods that you hit together. And you do it whenever the opposing player is shooting a free throw. And then behind them is just a sea of purple thunder sticks hitting and wavy. And what's the goal of that? The goal is this, that this player is supposed to be focused on that rim. But maybe, just maybe, if we all make an effort, they'll lose sight of the rim for a moment get distracted by something else, and miss their objective. This is what the enemy is trying to do in your life. He's doing everything he can to get your focus off of the eternal, off of what really matters, off of is Jesus going to ask me about this and will, the go this, will this go with me to eternity? He's trying to get your focus off of that on onto something else. Because when you do that, then you become the one running aimlessly and you miss the mark. And this is one of my big concerns about not only the time we, the last season, but also currently right now, is that there is, I, I just feel like the, the devil's everywhere, just waving thunder sticks. <laughs> and so many believers that I know are like all of a sudden just like distracted on something else. And it's not even sin. It's not like good versus evil on this stuff. It's just eternal versus temporal. And so, but, but one of the ways that he'll distract you, or one of the things he will use in your life to get your focus off of the eternal onto the temporal, is this, and I'm going to tie it all together, but hang with me, is insecurity. Insecurity in the life of a believer is one of the main ways that the devil gets your focus off of the eternal and onto the temporal. Because here's why. Insecurity at its core is simply this. Insecurity says Jesus is not enough, therefore I need Jesus and something else to make me secure. Insecurity is, Jesus isn't enough, I need something else to make me secure. My identity is not found in Jesus alone, it's found in Jesus plus other things. 
That's insecurity. If you're dealing with insecurity, it's because you haven't found your identity completely in Jesus yet. It's because you're not secure in Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, we come into church and sing worship songs all the time that say Jesus is enough. We just don't live like that. Hillsong has a song, All I Need Is You. All I Need Is You. All I Need Is You, Jesus. And we sing that, but it's like, all I need is you and that raise. All I need is you and the bigger house. All I need is you and recognition. All I need is you and, like, all I need is you and a certain amount of likes. All I need is you. And there's just, they sing another song, In Christ Alone. Here's the verse. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. But really, this is how some of us should sing it. In Christ alone. And some other things. <laughs> In Christ alone. And my dream happening. In Christ alone. And that bigger house, in Christ alone, and recognition, in Christ alone, and that, my hope is found. This is insecurity at its core is this. My identity is not firmly in Jesus. It's in Jesus and something else. But here's why insecurity distracts you from the eternal. Because insecurity is going to push you to short-term fruit. When you need something besides Jesus, when Jesus alone doesn't satisfy you, when Jesus alone isn't your security, then you are pushing, I need something else. And I need something else now. I don't need something else down the road. I need something else now. And so, and so I go towards short-term short fruit because Jesus alone can't satisfy me, so I need other things to satisfy me. And it, now, this is, why, this is why comparison is such a killer. Comparison is my life isn't secure in Jesus, and so I look at your life and go, if I had what you had, I'd feel more secure. If I had what that famous person had, if I had what my, what, what, just go down the list. And all of a sudden, I'm beginning to compare my life to your life because my life is not secure in my identity in Jesus. And so I'm looking at other people's lives thinking I need what they have in order to be secure. And the minute, the, the minute you go down the insecure path, I'm telling you, it pushes you to short-term temporal thinking because I need whatever I think is going to make me satisfied, whatever I think is going to make me secure, I need that now. And it's always short-term based. And so, so when we really, I, I mentioned this to you, but because we actually are like, my satisfaction in life is connected to something other than Jesus. When I said this last week, I, I mentioned a couple weeks ago, my, the book, the last, the last book I released, and we released it in June of 2020 on Blackout Tuesday. And you, I, don't, I don't want to repeat the story if you were here, but, you know, you're pushing hard to release this book, and you release the book, and, and it, literally we, didn't, we released the book, didn't even, make, didn't even mention it for a while because the nation was talking about other things. The Internet had kind of shut down, social media for sure had shut down for a little bit on Blackout Tuesday and all that. And, and, and if, when I, if I am thrown off by that, hear me on this. We defined success as faithfulness and obedience. The world defines it as a list you make, as amount of sales you do, the amount of money, the recognition you get. That's how the world defines success. But the kingdom doesn't define success like that. So if, my, if I'm thrown off by whether a book sells or doesn't sell, again, you're going to have to put this. I know not all of you write books, so you have to put this into your own world. Can you do that for me? But if I'm thrown off by that, if I'm really honest with myself, because I want to make a difference for Jesus in the earth. I want to make an impact for Christ. I want my life to actually make a difference. I want Jesus to use me to make a difference and, and strengthen and encourage the body of Christ. But if I'm honest, the emotions connected to the frustration around the book selling or not selling is not because of my passion to make a difference. It's because I'm looking for some type of recognition. It's because somewhere book sales will make me feel more secure. 
maybe a list I make, recognition around that thing. It's not actually about my passion to make a difference in, in the body of Christ. It's, it's actually about, I, it's not, and, and it reminds me, oh, it's not just Jesus that I'm looking for. It's Jesus plus something else. And so now I'm in pursuit of something else, but that something else is not actually eternal, it's temporal. Because when I get to heaven, Jesus is not going to ask me how many books I sold. He's just not. When I get there, he's not going to be like, Bannon, how many books you sell? I'm like, well, God, listen, man, it, we, like, it was June of 2020. I don't know if you remember what was going on, but there was, there was a lot going on. And, like, uh, you know, it was Blackout Tuesday, and, and I got, you know, whatever. And he's like, well, I don't know, Banny. Joel Osteen released a book around the same time, <laughs> and it did a lot better than yours. Like, Joel, go on in. Banny, you just wait there for a second. I don't know what I'm going to do with you and your low book sales. And, like, of course it's not going to happen, right? He says, say, Banny, were you faithful with what I gave you? Were you obedient with what I asked of you? That's it. And then I I if I was, he's going to say, well done, well done. But, but, but when I haven't found my identity in him, and here's part of what I run into with believers all the time. So many Christians live frustrated. I'm going to get into this concept in a second. But they live frustrated because something's not happening that they want to happen. And when, when, when my identity and security are not found in Jesus and Jesus alone, then what happens is, is I'm looking for something else. And if that something else doesn't happen, not only do I get frustrated, but it begins to fray my relationship with Jesus because I begin to believe like he owes that to me. Online, this is really good. Trust me on this. I know you're not, getting a lot, you're not hearing a lot of amens in the room, but this is, I'm telling you, really good. It's really, really good online. So um, we'll, we'll put them in and post. We'll, we'll put amens post-editing. It's okay. Uh, it's going to be an amen track post-editing. That's how it's going to be. I don't even know what I was talking about. No, I remember. So, so. So we get, I'm around so many people that they're so frustrated because a dream hasn't happened. Life didn't happen like they thought. They thought maybe they would have already gotten that promotion. They thought maybe they would have already had that. They thought maybe this. And they're frustrated. And I just want to go, and then we begin to go to God as if he owes us that. He owes me that. You owe me my destiny. You owe me the dreams in my heart. I'm all for you going after the dreams in your heart. Can you just say this, though? We're not in pursuit of dreams. We're in pursuit of Jesus. Je Jesus doesn't owe me my dreams. He doesn't owe me my dreams. My dreams are not where I find security or satisfaction. He's enough. He's enough. And as long as I have him, then good. And, and listen, the Bible says that all these things will be added unto you. I'm all for things being added unto you. I want you to be able to experience all that stuff. But, but it's not where my identity is found. It's not where my security is found. And what happens is, is this. When we allow insecurity to remain and we don't deal with it, it breeds discontentment. And I'm telling you right now, discontentment, it is, it is the thing that will get you to go after short-term fruit rather than uh, eternal fruit. You're just not content. Listen to this real quick. Let me just show you this. Disc get discontentment is going to distract you from eternity. We can never be satisfied with what we have and where we're at. We need more in order to be content. Jesus is not enough, so I need more. I need Jesus plus something else. Contentment comes from finding our identity fully in Christ and living for eternity. Let me tell you what Paul wrote. Paul writes to the church... In Philippi, he says this. He says in Philippians 4, he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. He tells Timothy that God, he says this, that godliness with contentment is great gain. So Paul has a value for contentment. He, tie, he actually connects it to godliness. But he says this, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. 
I can do all this through him who gives me strength. He says this, he's found the secret. Just you want to go like, Paul, what's the secret? Because when I live discontent, I'm constantly wanting more. I'm constantly never satisfied. I'm constantly not secure. And almost always it's pushing me to short-term fruit. Almost always I want something that isn't actually an eternal concept. Because eternal concepts are what? Did you love well? Faithfulness and obedience. So, so here's the secret that Paul says. Listen to Paul's secret. Philippians chapter 3. For he, he, he says it before, right? So Philippians chapter 4, he says, I found the secret. Philippians chapter 3 is where he shared the secret. It's this. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This is the concept of being found in Jesus. For whose sake I have lost all things. Listen to this. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. He says everything. He says, I just want to be found in him. I want to know him. Everything else is garbage. It, it's, it's not a good versus evil thing. It's not a sin versus righteousness thing. Paul just says, all of that is, here's, here's, Paul says, you don't know, you want to know how I live content? I just want to be found in him. Everything else is garbage. It's, you know, and that's great. If I get that promotion at work, man, it's awesome. But it's not where my identity is found. It's not where my satisfaction is found. It's not where my contentment is found. If it is, it's because I'm living temporary, I'm, I'm living in a temporal rather than eternal mindset. Jesus is all I need. And the enemy will distract you with, he will take insecurity and distract you from eternity because you're constantly looking for something short term that's going to satisfy. See, here, here's, here would be my challenge to you. Go find out what moves the heart of God and what impresses him and do that. We, we, live in a, we live in a world that, you know, we're around. We have many friends in ministry world. And some of, some of those friends, the Lord has opened some massive doors into Hollywood, entertainment, sports, business. They're around famous people. They're discipling famous people. They're around famous people. They're around people with a ton of money. They're around people that, that have a ton of Instagram followers, all that type of stuff. And I remember one of them, one of our friends who I love dearly, and I'm so grateful for these guys that are in that world because I'm like, we need more believers and ministers ministering in that world. But I remember one of them had, um, it, it, had come, it had come out that a pretty famous, pretty famous rapper had mentioned him in like a, uh, in, in a video, like in an interview, a, a, a video interview. And I remember this a few years ago. I remember watching it unfold on Twitter with all these other leaders. And, and this famous rapper mentioned this, this pastor I know, really great guy. But on Twitter, what unfolded was like this, like everybody was so unbelievably impressed. They were like, that's amazing. That is like next level something else, that that famous rapper mentioned you and knows you and that you're their pastor. That's incredible. And I just sat here and thought, I just thought, what is going on in our, when our, in our Christian circles when we are so impressed that somebody is, that is famous in the world mentions us or that we know them? I, I just think we are missing the mark when we are impressed by things Jesus is not impressed by. Listen, I, I love that they're in that, like, you hear me on that? I love that. What, what I don't love is that we're like super impressed. We act like if you know a famous person, I'm just giving you my world too. You'll have to, forget, my, my examples are going to be ministry. But, but we're so impressed by, man, you know a famous person? And you're like, you're their pastor and you're walking with him. That's incredible. And that's way more impressive than the family that moved to China to give up everything to go take care of orphans. 
that's way more impressive. I mean, I mean, that's cool you'd go to China and take care of the uh, kids that are dying that nobody else wants, but do you even have an Instagram? <laughs> and is there, are you, are you discipling anybody famous in China? Are you, you're, just, you're sitting around with orphans all day long, just loving on them? Okay, I guess. I guess that's okay, but, but is there anybody famous there? This is the silliness of it. Yeah. This is the silliness of it. And, and maybe you're not, they, none of, you guys aren't necessarily all in our world and ministry and all that type of stuff of what we're doing. But, but it's the same thing. I'm like, we're so impressed by things. And Jesus is like, I'm not really impressed by that. You know what moves my heart? Sons and daughters who love me and just want to obey and be faithful. That's what moves my heart. What moves my heart is you valuing what I value. I remember we had planned the church and things grew fast when we planned it. And uh, we were like at three services over at Folsom High School, and, and uh, people were coming. And man, I remember one Sunday, it was just a good Sunday. Like you just, everything just was dialed in. Worship was so strong, and all the services were packed. Uh, uh, I think for the most part, one o'clock was, but um, anyways, they were all full. <laughs> and, uh, serve, uh, people were at all of them. And, and my message that day, my sermon was just on point. Like, it's not always on point. Like, it's not always, but this one was just, good. it was strong. It was fire. It was fire. It was just, it's just one of those Sundays, you know? And you kind of leave going like, what a great Sunday, man. Everything was just good. The sermon was good. Everything was good. But in between, is that me? In between, that's the fire. They said, they said it's the fire. It's sizzling. Um, but it, in between services, I was out, we used to have that, that breezeway out there. I was out just kind of talking to people. Do you, need, do you need me to do something? Um, there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, our executive pastor, Becky Johnson. So in between services, I'm out. And uh, just greeting people, saying hello. Uh, just a chance to just say hi to people on Sunday. And this lady walks by. I had, I don't know, she's late 40s, early 50s, maybe. I don't know. I'm having a hard time nowadays judging what age people are. But she walks by. I hadn't met her yet. I just stopped. I said, hey, how are you doing? What's your name? And we talked for a minute. And she, she automatically was kind of shy and timid and apologetic. She said, hey, I've been coming for a few months, but... Um, I went to the first elements class. I haven't been back. Elements is the three-week course that all of you need to go to, by the way. All of you need to go to Elements if you haven't. But it's just kind of an introduction to our church, how to get involved, kind of that first step to jumping into community around here. She says, I've been to the first one, but I haven't been to the other ones. And she goes, I just deal with social anxiety. It's been pretty hard. But she, she goes, I've been coming to church, and, but I just, and she was like apologizing for not going to the club. And I'm like, oh, listen, I just took a moment and just loved her. I said, are you kidding me? I just... Don't, no prayer. Like, it's awesome you're coming. Well done getting here on Sundays. Don't worry about elements. You get to elements, we can get to elements. Like, there's no, like, just loving on her and being kind to her. And I took her back. I just a few minutes. I took her back to our host green room and introduced her to some people. That was it. It was a few minutes. It wasn't long. So I'm driving home after a phenomenal Sunday. I mean, good worship, packed crowds, sermon, just money. <laughs> and... And I'm driving home. I just take a moment just to kind of turn my heart to the Lord, just connect with him on the way home. And you know what he begins to talk to me about? He, he, didn't, he didn't talk to me about my sermon. He wasn't like, Banning, that sermon was <laughs> good. I just loved how you told the story, loved how you brought that in, loved how you tied that in. Banning, did you see the crowds today? He didn't tell me that. He's like, Banning, did you see the crowds today? It was packed. You know what he's talking about? That, the few minute encounter I had with that woman. He just said, he just, he just was like, Banning, thank you so much for taking time to love on her. He said, thanks for taking time just to stop and make sure that she knows that there's no pressure. And just thanks for being kind to her. He, he was talking about that lady the whole, and I'm like, Lord, did you not hear my sermon? Spend some time on that, God. I nailed some of those points. <laughs> Worship team, you guys can come up. But but he wasn't talking about that. 
And, and I just realized, I'm like, I'm not sure that he's impressed with the same things I'm impressed with. How am I supposed to have an eternal mindset when, when I'm impressed by things that he's just not impressed by? What moves his heart is faithfulness and obedience. I mentioned first service. Cliff, I didn't even know you were still in town, but Cliff over there. Cliff, Cliff who will always be a part of our church, but is not currently living here, is just visiting for a season. But last year retired from Folsom, worked for the city for years, retired, and the Lord just spoke to him to go, to go visit all 50 state capitals and to pray, not just to visit, to pray at every state capital, all 50 of them. So you know what he did last year? He retired. He retired at 42 years old. And uh, just kidding. <laughs> he could go to Don's group. Uh, he retired. He retired. Bought a new truck, spent the last year just driving around the nation. Drove to 48, had a hospital stay in there, had a fight on his hands. Flew to Juneau, flew to Hawaii, just did what the Lord asked him to do. Went to every capital. And I just think, that's what impresses God. And I, and I say this with love to Cliff, but nobody knows Cliff. Uh, his community would know that. But like the nation doesn't know that Cliff did that. There's no, there's no newspaper articles about it. There's no Instagram following about it. Nobody famous has said anything about it. And yet, I, I think I, I just go on like, yeah, that's, I think that impresses God. I FaceTimed a girl this week. I can't get into details about it, but we've known her. She's 26, married, has a child, is currently pregnant. I've known her, I've known her since she was three years old. Uh, she's in Iraq, her and her husband. They moved to be missionaries in Iraq. They, they moved into a neighborhood where no white people live just to reach the Kurds in Iraq. She's living there. No flash, just out there to reach people. FaceTime to her. Her living room doesn't even have a ceiling. When it rains, it rains in their living room. I just think I... I I think that moves the heart of God. You don't have to move to Iraq to move the heart of God, right? But, but faithfulness and obedience, finding your identity fully in Jesus, right? Finding your identity fully in Jesus, where, no, you are enough. I don't need other things to be secure. I don't need other things to be content. I don't need other things to be satisfied, which allows me, those can come and I enjoy them and they're wonderful. But I'm not in pursuit of those things because if I allow insecurity to come, it leads me to discontentment and that will just push me to short-term fruit. I need short-term fruit and I need it now and it's almost always temporal. Rather than just going, this life is short. I'm gonna stand before Jesus one day. And he's just not gonna ask me if I discipled anybody famous, right? He's not gonna go, you know, Becky's not gonna stand before him one day. It's like, Becky, you raised, you raised some kids, married, pastored. But did you know anybody famous? So say, well, I, I knew a guy who was on a local car commercial. <laughs> and God's like, ah, that doesn't cut it. I'm talking about somebody like famous, famous. Not Indiana famous. Not Wheatfield, she grew up in Wheatfield. Not Wheatfield, Indiana famous. Well, of course he's not gonna ask that. And so it's just, it's just, we just gotta lock in. And I'm looking for, I'm looking for people to say, I, I'm not here trying to build treasure on the earth. I don't mind if you have treasure on the earth, I love it. And if you have treasure on the earth, then you need to give to our building project. <laughs> So uh, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. We need treasure on earth to operate. I have no problem with treasure on earth, but it's just not what we're after. I'm not building treasure on earth. I'm trying to build treasure in heaven, an eternal thing, because that's where I'm headed. That's where I'm going. And I can, I can be chasing all this other stuff, but it's temporal, man. And I, I cannot allow my insecurity to push me to short-term fruit. Why don't you stand up with me? Give me a...
Becky, will you give me a thing? I'm looking for a people that say there's a greater prize that we're after. This world has nothing, this world has nothing it can give me that will ever satisfy me. This world has nothing they can give me. Do you know what's funny? You know what's interesting about cancel culture? Cancel culture, which I think is horrible. I think it's cancel culture is so unbiblical. We should have a whole sermon on that. It's so, it, just the concept, it's just completely lost all forgiveness and all that type of stuff. But let me just say this. Um, cancel culture only works if the world has something you want. Are you with me on this? Cancel culture only works if they, if, if people actually have something that you want. But if you think like, oh, you don't have anything I want. I mean, I love you. I want to be related. Are you with me on this? But I'm not looking for, I'm not looking for worldly affirmation. I'm not looking for people's approval. I'm looking for God's affirmation. I'm looking for God's approval.